Good afternoon and hello, uh, good morning in other parts of the world. Uh, I am Amelie Ekwe, I'm the Academic Dean of Globeethics.net and I have the privilege to welcome you to this first Blue Table webinar of the Globeethics.net Academy. This welcome uh, is directed to our students, to our academic instructors, colleagues, and friends around the world. We are particularly delighted to be able to welcome our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Ross Upshur of the Dalla Lena School of Public Health of the University of Toronto in Canada, and uh, our respondent, Professor Esther Mombo, of St. Paul's University in Limuru, Kenya. We have also invited uh, one of our pool of experts uh, members, Professor Mira Binder, who will join us later from uh, India. And so we kindly uh, ask you to bear with us uh, that um, at a certain moment we will uh, bring her uh, in as she arrives. She is currently um, completing a, a course and uh, so maybe slightly uh, delayed and join our conversation a little bit later. I am speaking to you from the Globeethics.net head office in uh, Switzerland and I am joined by my colleague, uh, the academic office manager, Ms. Lydia Slautskowski, and uh, my colleague, uh, Nefti Bempong Ahun, who is our assistant editor. I thank both for uh, preparing uh, this webinar um, and for supporting me. Um, and um, I shall um, say a few words on uh, globeethics.net for all our attendees who do not uh, yet know our organization. Our mission is to promote ethics in higher education. Uh, and therefore, we would like to bring people together to dialogue um, and to um, exchange on cutting edge issues um, in our world. And uh, we have set up uh, for the first time in this academic year, a series of six uh, webinars on different uh, topics to enrich our academic life. Uh, it is meant for our students in our um, online course program, but we thought it's also important to open it for a wider public and to send out an invitation to build together with us um, an alliance of knowledge sharing, if you will, uh, and of practice also grounded in values. My colleague Lydia will tell you a little bit more at the end of the webinar, how you can engage with globeethics.net, how you can benefit of our course program. But for the moment, I would like to introduce uh, this webinar dedicated to ethics and the pandemic. For about a year, the pandemic accompanies us now and uh, marks, I believe, all of our experiences of being in the world and what we believed to remain a short transitional period has now become what is so frequent, frequently called the new normalcy. This is to what we have to adapt in our private lives, in academia, in our societal life, in the economy, brief in all sectors, we have become aware of the vulnerability of our existence. But the other question to ask, I believe, is how do we react to the pandemic? Or perhaps more accurately, um, how can we be proactive? How can we be prepared and thus um, put the question in, in a more systemic uh, manner? How do we want to, to live and how can we adopt new lifestyles and create sustainable communities and societal infrastructures? So what is at stake in addressing the pandemic and what is it about um, ethics and uh, the pandemic? We realize that this is indeed a very multifaceted um, 
approach that we can see here, researchers present us, uh, for example, from the international law perspective, how human rights becomes a controversially de debated uh, issue and tensions arise uh, between fundamental rights um, of personal freedom on the one hand and civil and political rights on the other hand where the protection um, of um, societies is emphasized. On the other hand we find um, others who say that it's to deal in fact with this vulnerability and how um, aspects um, of non-discrimination or negative targeting of minority come to the fore, or we are confronted with issues of governance of public health measures. Uh, we have it with the quarantine, we have it with the vaccines at global, but also at national levels, and sometimes very contradictory um, principles and um, standards in terms of ethics. We all realized also, I believe, that the pandemic has sharpened our awareness for already existing polarizations and inequalities. So our common challenge remains, what do we learn and what are the consequences of our learning? Uh, this is where we as an organization providing uh, an environment for learning, but also learning ourselves um, are yeah, challenged. And therefore we are very much looking forward to what Professor Ross Upshur has to present to us. He is a physician by formation and serves as a professor at the Dalla Public Health School of the University of Toronto in Canada. His expertise, which um, reaches back to times prior to uh, this pandemic. He has worked um, extensively in areas of philosophy of medicine, but particularly in global health, public health and ethical principles and standards related to public health management in pandemic times. He invites us now to reflect on ethical issues in the COVID-19 pandemic and the question, will we ever learn? Ross, thank you very much for joining us and for having accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's a very great pleasure to be with you today and an honor and a privilege. So I'm going to just pull up my slides. It's a rather daunting task to summarize all of the uh, considerable ethical issues raised by uh, infectious disease uh, epidemics, but hopefully I will be able to uh, do this in a succinct and uh, a clear manner. Uh, one of the things I'm going to reflect upon are, uh, is this notion of lessons learned, and you'll see as I uh, walk through this how I've uh, thought about this. I've been working on uh, ethics and public health, ethics and infectious disease uh, for over 25 years now. Uh, and so that's where my uh, feeling that I keep saying the same thing over and over again comes from. So I'm going to start with a, an apology. Canadians are known to be uh, rather polite uh, and uh, you know you're with a Canadian when they say thank you to a, 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 an ATM. Uh, but I do want to apologize in advance if I miss key points, if I mislead, if I don't quote the proper theories. But most of all, I want to apologize if I waste your time, which is our most uh, precious uh, resource these days. So interestingly, yesterday, uh, there was, uh, you know, the ethics issues in the pandemic were front and center in the news, particularly around uh, the World Health Organization's uh, claiming that the uh, COVID-19 vaccine inequity is causing a catastrophic moral failure or uh, unequal vaccine distribution is a moral outrage. And the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, has been using a very strong normative language throughout this uh, uh, pandemic, particularly when it comes to the uh, concept of solidarity, and hopefully we'll have some time to talk about that. But uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I want to take us to the distant past, move to the recent past, talk about what lessons uh, have been learned or haven't been learned, 
And then I'm going to articulate what I call the pandemic playbook, because my sense on working on several infectious disease outbreaks over the last uh, 20 years, the first SARS here in Toronto, uh, got me and sort of changed my career and turned my focus from um, being more interested in the epidemiology of uh, respiratory uh, infections into the sort of social, political and ethical dimensions through our preparations for H5N1 to H1N1 to Zika, Ebola, and bring us to the present. Uh, and in each of those, I think there's some structural ethical issues for which we should have been prepared uh, when we came into COVID, and then maybe some discussion about how ethics can play a greater role uh, in uh, managing uh, pandemics. I want to start with two quotations from Albert Camus' book, The Plague, and I was encouraging everybody to read this early on in the pandemic, but now, of course, we're living the plot. Uh, but he does make two interesting uh, observations. One is that uh, pestilences or plagues or pandemics have a way of recurring in the world. But when they happen, it's hard to believe in the ones that crash down on our heads from the blue sky. And this time last year, as the world was moving into lockdown after the initial emergence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, from China, everybody was kind of feeling like, where did this come from? But he further observes that there's been as many plagues as wars in history, and they always take people equally by surprise. So despite all of the investment in preparedness and planning, why would a new uh, coronavirus take us by surprise? So if we go back in history and uh, in uh, Thucydides' uh, history of the Peloponnesian War, he has a lucid uh, description of the plague of Athens. And uh, one of the observations he makes is that physicians were, uh, they weren't of much service because they didn't know how to treat the disease and they died most thickly as they visited the sick most often nor did any human art succeed any better. Supplications, divinations were equally futile till the oval Roman nature of the disaster at last put a stop to them altogether. Thucydides describes how social uh, order started to break down in Athens as the uh, plague emerged and uh, lawlessness occurred. And so far, uh, we've been relatively good in COVID-19 at maintaining social order, though it has been strained in various places. The other interesting thing is this uh, unique epidemiological observation that people who come to care for people with infectious diseases are the ones, of course, who are at greatest risk. So physicians and uh, loved ones and caregivers, in fact, diseases uh, uh, spread through person-to-person -person contact of, uh, by various means and so caregivers are the ones who are disproportionately affected and that's been the case here uh, with SARS-CoV-2 as it was with Ebola as it was with uh, other uh, outbreaks. I put forth the picture of the uh, leper uh, in their garb with their hat and their gown, the Lazarus bell to ring to warn people of their imminent arrival so they could step aside. Uh, because we know that historically infectious diseases are strongly associated with stigma. Uh, and uh, I also put up the prayer of separation, which was often uh, read to uh, lepers once they were determined to have leprosy. And so if anybody has any lack of clarity about the relationship between normative language and the experience of infectious disease, I've just bolded all of the forbids and commands. It essentially casts you out of uh, human existence. And if I noted when I went back and reread this, I've used this slide for many years, uh, a lot of those proscriptions sound an awful lot like what we're now being asked to do for public health measures. You know, don't congregate, don't leave your house, uh, you know, you must uh, keep all of your uh, uh, tools and uh, accoutrements to yourself. Uh, so these are recurrent themes through history. And we've often used this need to separate the diseased from the well as a, as a default approach to uh, managing epidemics. And in this case, this is a picture taken from a newspaper in Canada uh, during a smallpox uh, outbreak in the late 19th century. And the idea here was that uh, all of the sick were contained in the quarantine hospital and the population who thought that they were well thought the best way to protect themselves then was to basically lock people in uh, the uh, uh, hospital itself. So these recurrent notions of separating the diseased from the well, and we're seeing that with the use of isolation and quarantine. 
So SARS in uh, 2003 was a major uh, warning sign to uh, us about the new uh, global environment. And on the other side here, I have the famous picture of the plague doctor uh, who has the personal, he's got gloves, he's got gown, he's got a mask. The pointed uh, uh, mask has a poultice because they would be entering into you know, very congested uh, uh, congregate living settings where people were close together with poor ventilation. And of course, bubonic plague is, uh, buboes are large nests of uh, uh, confluently filled uh, uh, lymph nodes filled with pus. So the stick was there for the purposes of uh, uh, inspection and palpation. SARS was supposed to be uh, the new era, the new age of epidemics as seen in Newsweek, but also these questions about what's the truth of SARS? Why does the virus spread? Uh, was China covering up? Should we be afraid? Now, this is uh, 18 or 19 years ago. Uh, so it's in our recent memory that it seems, as I said, for, to pick up on the point from Camus, that we had never had these thoughts before when SARS-CoV-2 arose. We come to the modern age and you see that healthcare professionals are using more or less the same form of personal protective equipment. Uh, the only difference is the advent of plastics, but gowns, gloves, masks, uh, and, uh, and uh, as a barrier to uh, being transmitted from infection. We then became concerned about H5N1, a highly pathogenic avian influenza uh, uh, this was shown to be highly fatal in the uh, small proportion of humans that uh, uh, did contract it. And the issue here became uh, that the clock was ticking. We hadn't had a major uh, epidemic of influenza for several years. Uh, many people involved in public health and epidemiology were concerned about the uh, advent of a new pandemic. Uh, you can see here on the on the right, uh, these gentlemen, there was a case of highly pathogenic H5N1 found in a bird. I think this is near the border between uh, Romania and Hungary. And the only people at risk are these poor gentlemen uh, fogging the train. And I like to joke that I've never really seen a, a bird hitchhiking uh, on top of a train. They're actually flying high above us, but we tend to recurse to some some form of symbolic behavior to show that we're on the on the on the case of course h5n1 did not become uh, the pandemic but in 2009 we had the swine flu epidemic uh, an h1n1 influenza virus that had uh, remnant genetic material from the 1918-1919 swine flu and of course, this caused uh, considerable concern. Uh, there was uh, fears that we wouldn't have enough uh, ventilators, that uh, intensive cares were going to become overwhelmed with uh, cases, and that uh, we would, didn't have the health system capacity to respond for in 2009. And now, of course, a concern about vaccines. When there was a death in Toronto, all of a sudden there was a huge demand for uh, H1N1 vaccine. And we're seeing similar concerns now with COVID vaccines. As much as there's some hesitancy in the population, uh, many older adults in particular are strongly interested in getting the vaccine. And we're having difficulty in terms of setting priorities for the uh, distribution of doses. And that's a global problem as well. I want to reflect a little bit about Ebola. Uh, so now we're up to 2014. Um, Ebola was declared a, a, a threat to peace and security by the UN. At the time, it was considered the biggest threat to uh, 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 security uh, in the history of the UN. And now it seems like a rather manageable outbreak in comparison to what we're seeing in, uh, COVID-19. And this notion that we need uh, major uh, international cooperation, uh, this concern about uh, security uh, that recurs with these large outbreaks. Of course, Ebola was the trial run for the use of lockdowns. And the first time a lockdown had been used in a major urban environment was during Ebola in September of 2014, uh, when Sierra Leone had a three day lockdown so they could go uh, door to door to try to take a census of people with fever. There was concern that uh, cases were being hidden from public health because of the stigma and the highly fatal nature of the disease. And of course, uh, almost every jurisdiction around the world has had some form of lockdown, including here in Toronto. Uh, 
The other interesting thing about epidemics is they tend to bring out the darker side of our uh, uh, of human behavior. Uh, black markets start to uh, 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 thrive. Uh, in Ebola, it, uh, uh, rumors were uh, circulating that uh, uh, whole blood uh, from survivors was protective and uh, survivors of Ebola were reluctant to come forward uh, to identify themselves and there was interest in the health community for setting up cohorts to follow to look at the long-term consequences but people were afraid that they would be captured and held against their will uh, to have their uh, uh, blood uh, uh, taken from them and again we see around the world including in Canada various black markets uh, of uh, being created. The other issue to think about is the uh, long-term consequences of, uh, of disease uh, for survivors and their families. So not only do you have uh, the large amount of grief in communities from, uh, from the high fatality associated with the disease, but you have the uncertainty uh, that people who have been ill, uh, the fear that they might become reinfected. So we know that pandemics, uh, you know, all people uh, have hugely disruptive uh, impacts on every aspect of human life. And that's, that's very much every aspect of a pandemic response uh, entails uh, ethical issues. I would be remiss to go on without mentioning MERS and Zika, uh, both of which, uh, so Zika was a public health emergency of international concern in 2016. The point I'm trying to make with this uh, quick walk through recent history is that since the international health uh, uh, regulations were re, uh, revised in 20, 2005 and created this concept of a public health emergency of international concern, we've had several H1N1, Ebola, Zika, now SARS-CoV-2 and Ebola, all of which have become uh, public health emergencies of international concern, which is the highest level of global alert, which means that the impact of pandemics or epidemics is becoming recurrently common, and thus it's something that we should be extremely well prepared for. So after Ebola, there was a considerable uh, uh, discussion around lessons learned. Uh, so Bill Gates had a major paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Major organizations uh, had uh, started to worry about what are the lessons to, to be learned. Here in Canada, we've had uh, lessons learned from uh, SARS in 2003 and from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. Uh, though, as I point out here, it's very hard to find what those lessons are because the content of those reports have been archived and aren't available for easy access. So it's like we consciously forget. Uh, the, these notions also that a wake-up call. So SARS was a wake-up call for global health, as was the H1N1 swine flu. And if you look to COVID, of course, it's another global wake-up call for which we need to learn lessons. And you can see from headlines that the ethical issues for COVID-19 have been strikingly similar to issues that have been risen by other ones, the use of quarantine, uh, the notion that we're going to run out of uh, vaccine uh, or ventilators, that uh, we're going to have to resort to some new forms of social monitoring, such as contact apps or vaccine passports or immunity licenses. So uh, after Ebola, uh, I got a bit grumpy about all of this. And I said that the, when I looked at all of the lessons learned documents and summarized them, what we found is that most of the lessons that we needed to learn were in some ways, nor or in most ways, normative or ethical lessons. And that the most powerful lesson we learned from Ebola was that we don't learn lessons. And uh, so I sort of quipped that we either have a form of collective amnesia or collective narcolepsy because we keep forgetting or keep falling asleep and we need to uh, hit the snooze button and uh, learn our lessons all over again. And so we summarized our thinking in two papers, one published in 2015 in Public Health Ethics, and then we revisited it with uh, a paper recently in a, 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 in a series of papers in the Journal of Bioethical Inquiry on uh, COVID a symposium that we published. So what I'd like to argue is that there are there is this pandemic playbook and on the left hand side are the events 
and on the right hand issue side are the ethical issues and my argument is all of these are more or less predictable all of these have occurred in almost every outbreak i've mentioned and as i've uh, tried to indicate go back into antiquity so you know hearkening to that uh, quotation from uh, thucydides there's usually high early morbidity and mortality, particularly around healthcare professionals and caregivers. And this was exactly the case in Wuhan. Uh, physicians, nurses, uh, family members who come to care became ill. And the issues these arise are predictably issues for healthcare professionals around their obligations to care for people uh, in the uh, context of a pandemic. And in 2005, I co-chaired the uh, duty to care of health professions in pandemics uh, to sort of explore the issues of uh, where these obligations and how, how extensive they were because most of the regulatory bodies and codes of ethics were silent. But there's also this reciprocal uh, duty to protect on behalf of health systems to aid and assist uh, healthcare providers to prevent them from becoming ill. High levels of uncertainty, again, back to the cities, we don't have effective treatments, we don't know how to care for patients, exactly the same case uh, with SARS-1, uh, H1N1 was a little different, we had so, at least a vaccine and some uh, medication, but with SARS-CoV-2, same thing, no effective medication, no vaccine, a totally novel uh, virus. And this raises all of the issues around research ethics and whether we need to countenance, uh, countenance uh, pandemic exceptionalism, that is to shorten up or somehow uh, reduce the uh, strictures of uh, research ethics oversight. And uh, one of the first things we did with our WHO ethics committee was to actually argue against pandemic exceptionalism and to argue that in times of an emergency is no time to take shortcuts on research ethics. As I've alluded to, there's always a need for counter public health uh, countermeasures to contain spread. Uh, this you know, might include things like isolation, quarantine, uh, some form of movement restriction, uh, count, you know, uh, uh, contact tracing apps, uh, vaccine passports, all of these public health measures to uh, protect the community. And this, of course, raises issues with respect to public health ethics and how we think about justifying these restrictions, how we balance the needs and rights of individuals versus the needs and uh, rights of a community. And of course, we'll always face scarcity, and this raises issues around resource allocation and priority setting. One of the first issues that came up uh, in high income settings was the need to uh, think about triage policies for critical care resources if the system becomes truly overwhelmed, as was reported in Italy uh, about this time last year. And then uh, scarcity with respect to vaccines. How do you set about to fairly and equitably and justly uh, allocating these resources? And this leads to the last question around structural inequity, local and global, uh, where I started with a quotation from the World Health Organization. And again, a global health or a public health ethics question around how much global solidarity we have. And I will argue all of these were evident and uh, basically written into the script of how this uh, pandemic has played out. And yet it seems that health systems uh, were in the, and uh, countries were uh, trying to start from scratch from the beginning rather than building on what's been known. And of course, we know that these issues are highly complex and that the need to integrate various different forms of knowledge. And you'll see that most uh, health systems uh, defer to uh, some form of evidence-based decision-making in which positive science is given pride of place over uh, the needs of ethics and the need to integrate eth levels of ethical reflection from the personal through clinical, professional, organizational, and up to the global. And my uh, big wish is that the ethical issues would be seen to be co-constitutive with the scientific issues when it comes to responding to uh, a pandemic, particularly in times of high uncertainty. Now, it's not that there isn't a shortage of guidance for this, and they do exist. The World Health, you know, three of these uh, uh, documents I've worked on, including this uh, green book on guidance for managing ethical issues in infectious disease outbreaks. And I've just completed a study to see the extent to which there's been uptake of these documents in 
sort of technical and other response documents. And sadly, the uh, uh, penetration of ethical reasoning into uh, guidance and response documents is very poor. And I must conclude with some thoughts around this. And I have to give a, 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 a pride of place to the Nuffield, Nuffield Council, which published a report on the 28th of uh, January last year, right when, around the time when uh, a public health emergency of international concern was to, uh, declared for uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, they published a really nice document on research and global health emergency, so very timely. And there's, you know, I've spent uh, 20 years publishing research on virtually every aspect of those uh, uh, pandemic playbook. and. Uh, got me thinking why we're not actually making progress in getting ethical reasoning into pandemic response. So that's where I'd like to open up the discussion. How can ethics be better engaged? So despite complaints about uh, ethics oversight in uh, research, uh, ethics guidance is well established and uh, many uh, research ethics boards are functioning. But I think we need to consider better ways of translating ethics into pandemic planning and response. And so to that, I think we need to learn from the growing uh, field of knowledge translation and implementation science. So implementation science is interesting from an ethical point of view because uh, the most of the focus there has been on is implementation science different from other forms of research so that you don't need ethical oversight, but uh, implementation science uh, really focuses on context and translation of knowledge into particular contexts. So rather than looking at whether implementation science is uh, distinct from other forms of research, we should start to use the techniques of implementation science, the understanding of context, uh, the working uh, with uh, people actually involved uh, on the ground uh, to better get ethics into, uh, uh, into place. I think we need to uh, better use health communications tools, uh, you know, social media, use of video. And I do think we need uh, better preparation and training of health professionals uh, in ethics. So our, our group here in Toronto back in, the, uh, in 2005 prepared a, 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 an ethical framework for responding to uh, pandemic influenza. But when we went back to look at it, uh, we recognized that it actually still had strong utility uh, within a, a, a COVID response. So we articulated in a Canadian context, uh, what we thought were 10 substantive values that needed to be uh, openly discussed and, and, and uh, debated and to inform policy. And we also had a, a focus on uh, procedural values to ensure that there was inclusive, fair uh, decision making. And interestingly, this kind of framework became uh, the backbone of the WHO's uh, pandemic ethics response, but other jurisdictions have taken it up, notably New Zealand, and populated the substantive values with more local values related to uh, the Maori population. So it's a, it's a, it's a useful tool. Uh, we focus particularly on these sort of gluey principles about the need to engage communities to build trust, uh, reciprocity, solidarity, and equity. Um, so I'm going to conclude, uh, this isn't actually a picture of Sergei Korsakov, it's uh, a bit of a joke. Sergei Korsakov is the Russian neurologist who described Korsakov syndrome, uh, which occurs when people have, uh, 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 when they lose their capacity to process short-term memory. And I think we've had a kind of collective Korsakov syndrome when it comes to um, uh, pandemics and pandemic preparedness, we seem to forget very quickly uh, what we've experienced recently. Uh, but Santayana, of course, quoted in his, uh, uh, most people know the quotation, but not its source. It came from a series of volumes he published on the history of reason. But he did say that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And we seem to be reliving the same lessons over and over in our ethical response to pandemics. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention. I hope this was of some value and I will stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Ross. Uh, this has been a very uh, rich, uh, also very dense uh, contribution. And I'm sure that this will 
uh, open many avenues for questions from our attendees um, and uh, conversation uh, around it before we enter into this first part of questions and answers and you are invited also to uh, continue to share in uh, the, the, the question and response um, section if you have questions uh, we will harvest and uh, collect them uh, right uh, now. I would like to recognize uh, the arrival of Professor Mira Baindu of the Manipal University in Jaipur in India. She is our pool of experts uh, member and professor of philosophy. She is also part of our network. And after Professor Mombo's uh, intervention, we will call upon her for uh, a short and um, statement uh, as well that contributes to uh, the way we relate also to um, our different um, stakeholders in different parts of the world. Now to your questions, please um, articulate your questions. You can also um, write them in uh, the chat box or in the question and responses section my colleagues will have an eye on it and report on any questions that we see. While we are waiting for incoming uh, questions, uh, may I start perhaps with um, uh, my own uh, question. Um, I just see that there is a question. I hand over to my colleague Nefti for um, presenting these questions to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelie. Yes, we did indeed get a question uh, in the Q&A. And I'd just like to thank you again for this really thought-provoking um, and highly relevant uh, presentation. So the first question is from Lucy. Uh, she first of all would like to thank you for walking us through the history responses to plagues, epidemics and pandemics, um, and also the ethical aspects, which are really enlightening. Uh, her question is, could you tell us more about the culture of solidarity that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation? Thank you. Would you like me to answer that now? Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, solidarity is a, an interesting ethical concept, but what was fascinating about it was the fact that the at the initial uh, meeting of the WHO R&D blueprint uh, uh, for which when they established uh, the nine working groups that were going to help uh, the global response to the pandemic, um, it was the term that the director general of the World Health Organization turned to again and again. Uh, in his discussions, the importance of solidarity, the importance that uh, uh, we're all in this together. And I think early on, uh, there was a pandemic in the sense that all people in the world as it was spreading, uh, were facing same or similar challenges. But I think what we're seeing now is it devolving into a series of localized epidemics. And I think that uh, uh, the solidarity that was wished for is very much in jeopardy at this stage. Uh, I noted uh, in the, on the news this morning uh, that, for example, that the European Union is maybe passing a law to uh, you know, slow down the uh, export of vaccines, which would certainly be uh, an anti-solidarity movement. Um, so it's, it's hard for us to uh, maintain a solidaristic uh, perspective, it seems, for a long time because political leadership is always faced with the needs to respond to its uh, local population. So I'm hoping that there is some uh, pushback and greater discussion to it. There is a, actually a very fascinating literature on the uh, role uh, that solidarity plays, particularly in as a principle in uh, public health uh, ethics. And I'd be happy to uh, uh, share those resources uh, with this group if they're interested. Thank you so much, uh, Ross. Yes, indeed, we will be uh, very interested in, in receiving also uh, these um, references. Um, just looking out for other questions from the attendance. 
Nefti, as far as I can see, uh, not for the moment. We have still um, a second part that we have foreseen. Uh, then I would invite uh, Professor Esther Mombo to um, uh, offer us uh, her response. Um, Esther Mombo is um, teaching at uh, the uh, St. Paul's University in Limuru, Kenya. Um, and uh, we have a long-standing uh, collegial um, uh, relationship and uh, we exchanged during the, uh, the first um, lockdown period last year already how this affects our professional uh, lives and how we uh, kind of have, have been challenged to uh, to change ourselves and to adapt um, uh, in that regard. This is particularly from an educator's perspective, um, also, um, yeah, something that, um, uh, that uh, we were uh, concerned about. How do we uh, teach under these um, circumstances and how can academic life uh, continue? But we are also most uh, interested in learning a little bit from you, uh, Esther, how societal life um, um, has uh, changed and how the um, public health um, sector um, has reacted um, um, and has been able to cope uh, with uh, the pandemic um, situation. Um, how does what Ross presented resonate uh, with you against the background of your experiences? Thank you, Esther, for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I'm speaking from St. Paul's uh, University, Limuru. It is afternoon and uh, very good, good weather uh, uh, as uh, a rainy season is starting soon, we hope. But uh, I'm speaking from an institution that just opened in January. And uh, we do have uh, students, we have um, water and sanitizers around the university and labels everywhere. And we have students, younger students with masks around. But sometimes I think they wear masks when they see an administrator, but after that, they do not wear it. But I'll speak to that a bit uh, more later. So thank you again for inviting me to participate in this. And, and thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Ross, for uh, that uh, insp inspiring and challenging talk about uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, the last quote is what sometimes we use in history that those who don't remember the past, of course, do repeat it. And thank you for showing the source of it. So COVID-19, of course, is a global pandemic as has been shown and as we know. And the rules to mitigate this pandemic at the level of the public health are at the same time localized uh, in terms of how each context uh, is going to, to mitigate the, 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 the pandemic. It has been observed that sometimes these mitigations of the pandemic are skewed towards the particular class of people. That is a class that has access and a class that is able and I'll say that a bit more. So social distancing, for example, uh, how does it work in a crowded informal uh, settlement or a crowded uh, class of primary uh, uh, school students who have very little and have to be crowded together to, to study? So those mitigation uh, 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 processes are problematic for some and it may be not for others. And they do raise, of course, ethical issues. Why do some have and some do not have? So it is a year since uh, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. And our government, uh, 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 to stop the spreading of the pandemic, closed all schools and universities. So from March last year to January, there was no uh, 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 on-site schooling. Speed teachers were advised to prepare work for students to do at home. 
However, uh, it is clear that the lack of uh, broadband internet and the cost of Wi-Fi in many of the remote areas and even within the urban centers limited the amount of uh, e-learning that would be available for, for the students. The lockdown as one of the measures to limit the spread of the pandemic worked well for some social groups and not others. A mother in an informal settlement staying home, she argued, was not safe as she faced the danger in form of hunger and death. In fact, saying that before COVID-19 kills us, hunger would have killed us. The, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic ne impacted negatively uh, on gender relations. And as we have seen both in our own country and in the world, the increase of gender-based violence and sexual uh, gender-based violence. Of course, uh, COVID-19 brought to light the deep, what we found as the deep disparities among people in form of what we saw as human greed, inequity, uh, depletion, ex exploitation, confusion, uh, rage, hate, and lack. These are reflected even to date in our own uh, communities and even in our own academic institutions. An increase of fear, anxiety, and, and suspicion <clears throat> of each other uh, because of the stigma uh, uh, or, 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 or for those that <clears throat> were positive. Of course, COVID-19 did cause social disruption of the practices that were very common to human society in a, a country like Kenya that is 80% uh, uh, religious uh, 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 worship services, whether they were church or mosque, were no longer the same. And leaders had to rethink on how best to offer those services. A few could organize online services, but if you didn't have uh, internet, it was impossible. Because weddings and funerals, which is a social activity for, for many of the people, uh, were also, uh, uh, which were attended, would be attended by huge numbers of people, were disrupted. Only a few could attend uh, uh, when the processes of opening up were put into place. So questions such as how do you accompany each other uh, uh, at times of joy and even times of pain? And it's been observed that there's a lot of uh, tension, a lot of um, uh, pain that people are carrying and which has, is leading to a lot of mental health issues. Talking about education, with the closure of universities and schools, we had to find other ways of offering learners an opportunity to continue. But COVID-19 uh, brought to light the deep digital divide within the country, and I'm sure within the nations. So schools were expected to implement online instruction using technology uh, and the internet, but teachers advised to prepare work for students to do at home. However, as I've noted that uh, the expenses of Wi-Fi, lack of broadband internet did not help many of the schools and majority of the schools. This was the same uh, uh, for primary, for high school and for, for university. My university uh, turned to e-learning, uh, but clearly not many of our students at that time could access even what we were supposed to use some of the faculties were not even trained over the e-learning uh, processes. So the cost of internet for universities and for families made uh, a many not to access uh, any, any learning at all, especially for the first six months. Both parents and teachers, and even those who are able, did not have uh, 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 the hardware such as mobile uh, devices or laptops or computers and lack of training for parents and teachers was also pretty problematic. So one of the challenges in academic was this digital divide. And the digital divide was not just a technology divide, but also a socio-economic uh, uh, aspect of society. 
it was a, a revelation on how uh, the class divide is about the minority who have access and the majority who do not have access at all. So when a measure to curb the disease is social distancing, of course, it was creating further social distancing in terms of affordability of the social amenities. As well as the social digital divide uh, that was very, very glaring among institutions uh, uh, in one country, uh, in academia, we've experienced an increase of gender-based violence and sexual gender-based violence among uh, students, particularly an increase of child marriages or teenage pregnancies and uh, lots of uh, female uh, genital mutilation. We also experience uh, an increase in substance abuse among uh, uh, adults, but also among uh, uh, students leading to uh, uh, mental health issues. So the female gender particularly has had to struggle during this uh, pandemic uh, uh, of, of lockdown being locked down in spaces that they are not able to defend uh, uh, themselves, seeing lots of gender stereotypes uh, 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 aspects coming up to, to the fore. And so women and girls being vulnerable to, to that. In January, uh, schools were opened uh, uh, and you, some of the universities were opened, like uh, even my own uh, 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 was opened. Uh, schools were opened partly because exams had to be done in order to take students to the next level of, of, of learning. So we have had exams going on, especially for, for high schools and universities catching up with the exams in order to move to the second stage so that students, new students can even attend. But we've also discovered that uh, there are students who have not attended, they have not returned. And, and for female students, what we discover is most of them, either they got pregnant during the, the, the lockdown period and have not been able, able to, to return. This week, we are having exams of high school and uh, over the news, we've seen uh, 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 young students, 14 years, 15 years, having to drop out of an exam room to deliver a baby or having to rush off to go and deliver uh, a, a baby. So the experiences of these young mothers is yet to be captured. And it, it does raise, of course, ethical issues. It, it raises uh, 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 the, the forms of religiosity that we have, but also, brings up challenges within both the educational, health, uh, economic, and political sectors of the society. So how does one hold the tensions of, uh, of restrictions and protection? Because a uh, lockdown was uh, intended to curb the spread of the disease, but within the lockdown, there was no sense of protection Hence, some of the challenges that I have raised above. So the cases, for example, of gender-based violence was an indication that there was restriction, but there was no, no protection. How does one hold these two together in informal settlements or where there is lack of space? And, and, and how does one uh, uh, really support those within the marginalization? So of course, one thinks of the ethics of uh, 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 care, uh, ethics of care, and in, in, in putting down some of those ethics I've seen by the professor uh, uh, raising them. I've seen resilience within communities where uh, parents and teachers have tried to, to innovate and, and to see that education has, has gone on, uh, teaching, teachers visiting uh, uh, students. But ethics of care uh, include, of course, aspects of thinking through issues around the legacies of uh, patriarchy and, and sexism and seeing how this impacts the educational uh, 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 spaces. And the ethics of care, of course, uh, would include uh, people to look at issues around justice and justice demand transformation of relationships, whether they're economic or religious. It demands that aspects of love, equity, 
a stewardship trust, uh, a fairness come to the front. So the academics have struggled and continue to, to struggle, but it is those that are on the uh, uh, margins of society that have struggled even more. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Esther. This has been uh, a very interesting uh, contribution because I think you uh, really also um, highlighted how in a very specific uh, situation you are working in and uh, in addition in a societal um, uh, context, uh, those observations uh, that Ross made earlier on, uh, on um, ethical issues in the, the pandemics uh, clearly comes to the force to the fore, uh, you have mentioned um, the resilience uh, in connection with an ethics um, of, of care. And um, that brings us back to um, uh, the uh, second uh, round of uh, questions or comments, if there are. Uh, I'm passing over to my colleague Nefti again to see if there are any questions or comments? Thank you, Emily. Uh, there are no questions for now, but we do have a comment from one of our attendees, um, really just highlighting also the challenges that are encountered from transitioning from on-site learning to virtual uh, and also some of the struggles um, echoed in terms of uh, lack of network connectivity, uh, which caused many students to also drop some of their units. Um, so that that was the comment we had from one of our attendees. I, yeah, I will pass back to Emily. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nefti. Uh, I have a question uh, that uh, that uh, Ross uh, can can answer, um, uh, perhaps because this is something he mentioned uh, in his intervention uh, earlier on, and that relates perhaps also to what. Um, uh, to what uh, um, Esther um, said is uh, how can um, ethics be better engaged in a pandemic um, situation and you mentioned Ross um, the um, techniques from implementation science um, and, and knowledge translation where one pays more closely an attention to um, understanding uh, people on the ground. Perhaps you could say a few uh, more words about um, about this and how can this uh, contribute to um, strengthen um, uh, a better engagement with ethics? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so thinking on this is rather early on, but picking up on, on, on Esther's points, uh, when public health is asking people to uh, restrict themselves or, or or putting restrictions in part there's a reciprocal duty uh, on the behalf of those who are making the request to people to uh, restrict themselves to support them and that means uh, actually getting on the ground and figuring out what kind of supports are required by communities and populations in order to uphold uh, uh, quarantine or isolation or, or lockdown restrictions. Uh, this was really driven home to me uh, when I was uh, working on the SARS pandemic. So I was uh, taken away from my role as a, an avuncular family physician because I am a public health physician as well uh, to work with one of the local public health units uh, to work on epidemic control, but I quickly became deputized as an associate medical officer of health and became responsible for enforcing uh, the quarantine and isolation rules. So uh, I, I was uh, in a very different role. And what you find is that on the, you know, on the ground, what people are experiencing in their everyday lives are a series of challenges and barriers uh, that I think health authorities are only dimly aware of. So part of that contextual understanding is actually working with and engaging communities and having uh, your finger on the pulse of what are the intended and unintended consequences of the public health intervention. Uh, and really implementation science directs you to uh, a detailed and rich understanding of those contextual uh, variables. Now that gets you only so far, 
Uh, <laughs> but it's at least a better start than uh, simply having an edict and uh, pretending that everybody is going to uphold it equally. And I think in the future, we're going to have to pay a lot more uh, attention to this because of some of the issues that Esther has highlighted that were unanticipated uh, consequences of uh, locking people down and restricting their mobility. It actually put some people at greater risk than uh, they were otherwise would be. So the duty to, uh, to protect was actually violated by putting people at greater risk. So we know that now, how do we put in processes to mitigate that? Thank you very much, uh, Ross. Uh, let me just uh, verify if uh, Mira is uh, with us and is um, ready to uh, to make a very brief um, uh, intervention. Perhaps just uh, uh, two, three sentences on uh, the situation uh, she is in in India. What are your observations, Mira? Thank you uh, for your the previous speakers. They did bring the idea into perspective. So I would like to uh, just share from my experience uh, three points. The first point is that when we were looking at uh, uh, the, um, the question of uh, public health and uh, solidarity, basically what occurred to me was that uh, it against a background of an already present solidarity against a background of an already present community, people were able to gather together and um, sort of be in the ethical world. There were lots of acts of immense kindness, immense sharing, immense community building. Uh, our medical staff in the hospitals have gone way beyond their duty to be, uh, to be the messengers of health that they were. So that is my experience in India. But against the same backdrop, uh, the inequalities that were there in society already showed up. So when, when we say pandemic, it's supposed to hit everyone similarly. But unfortunately, inside our uh, country, it didn't hit everyone equally. It hit some people more. You've heard of the migrants who walked kilometers because they're uh, still people are still not recovered from that. So it hit people unequally. And... Uh, one of the other things about India that was very, very important was that we were all in a movement of activism where people were gathering in large numbers to protest against certain injustices that were done to them, uh, particularly like some citizenship rules were there. Now we're having the farmers protest. So in light of that, what actually happened was when people started talking about uh, uh, physical distancing and being safe, the people were so much affected by the inequalities and the kind of difficulties that they had that they chose to ignore the threat to their life and still fight for their rights. So I don't know where we should place this kind of idea of social ethics because uh, it, it became that, it, became, it, it becomes that a pandemic doesn't bring in a new set of problems but it all exposes the problems that are already there in the system. And I think what happens to us is when the pandemic comes, we get very busy dealing with the pandemic and the responses to the pandemic. But what the pandemic has done is to expose the problems that were already there. And a case in point is the air pollution levels in India are so high that if the air pollution levels had already been handled as a problem earlier, the kind of seriousness of pandemic in polluted areas, uh, the number of people having respiratory disorders would have been much lesser. So if there's no, if there's already a problem of hygiene and cleanliness and availability of soap, then probably, you know, it's it's like instead of, instead of a response to the pandemic, an ethical response to the pandemic, I personally feel that if you had already tackled the problems that were ethically being ethical all the time and not just in the context of pandemic. And so there's a learning from the pandemic. It's like something somebody has torn apart our, uh, our uh, you know, and shown a mirror to us. So I feel that that is something which I would really like to think about, like how can we be socially responsible and not just, you know, respond immediately when the pandemic occurs. Thank you, Emily. Uh, that, that, those are the two points I wanted to make. 
Thank you so much, uh, Mira. I think uh, we, we have the impression that we traveled around the world with uh, gaining all your insights uh, from Canada to Kenya uh, to India. And um, yeah, it seems that uh, we have many lessons to learn and we have become once more aware of the complexity. Um, and I think what I take away from your intervention at the beginning, Ross, is how can ethics uh, be uh, better engaged in, first of all, um, being, uh, being aware of, um, uh, of these um, what uh, what Mira now says uh, this um, being exposed um, uh, to the problems um, in the system, being able to name them and then uh, offer um, a framework um, of um, understanding and then of dealing with them, uh, kind of overcoming. Uh, the disruptive impact um, of the dip, uh, of the pandemic uh, in our lives. Um, I feel that we could continue on and on uh, with unfolding uh, this huge topic, uh, of course, that will accompany us. Uh, but we have made a start and we have started the conversation. We will continue it. Uh, for the moment, I do thank you all again, Ross, Esther and uh, Mira. I shall again uh, present uh, her officially. Um, Mira is um, a professor of uh, philosophy at the Manipal University in Jaipur in uh, India. Thank you so much to all the three of you. And uh, now, uh, if there are no other questions, I have a look and Nefti will uh, join me in making sure that we haven't look, overlooked anything, uh, then I will pass on to Lydia for the closure. And thank you all for uh, your time. Thank you. Lydia, over to you. <laughs> thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Emily. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank all our invited speakers, Ross, Esther, Mira. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Um, I believe everyone enjoyed uh, the presentation and discussion, and it was very informative and stimulating. And I think we have covered our topic from different perspectives. Thank you all once again. And uh, taking this opportunity, I would like to invite you to consult our academy page, globethics.net slash academy. And to know more about our courses, we have two upcoming courses starting on the 12th of April. It's uh, the course on responsible leadership and also into religious cooperation for peace. Uh, please have a look and registrations are still open. Don't miss your chance. And also uh, related to, to, to our topic today, uh, you, can find, um, you can find the consultation process on COVID-19 and higher education. Please feel invited to participate. And uh, also I would like to announce our next uh, Blue Table webinar which will be on the topic of ethics and diversity. It will take place on Wednesday, 21st of April from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, for more registration and for more information registration, please follow the link globethics.net slash blue table webinars. Thank you also to all of you who have tuned in and participated. We look forward to having you join us for our next webinar and this concludes our webinar. We hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you all for attending.